So Father Bruno Clifton is lector here in the Pentateuch and the historical books of the Old Testament, but his main job is being master of novices of the English Dominican province, and the novicity is now at Blackfriars, Cambridge. Um, I became novice master, but in Edinburgh um, nearly 30 years ago, and since I liked taking people on long walks, I was warned not to run the the visit like a boy scout camp. But I've had to warn Father Bruno, who's got much more energy than I ever had, not to run it as a fell running club. Um, Father Bruno did his licence in the sacred scripture at the Pontifical Biblical Institute and a doctorate at the University of Cambridge, taking a socio-anthropological approach to the Book of Judges. His current research is on how concepts of identity are influential on the formation of biblical texts as socially authoritative. He's written several articles and reviews, including Converging Transcendental and Terrestrial Reality, How Assumptions Bind the Biblical Text in Order to Free It, and What If Israel Was God's Stubborn and Rebellious Son. So we're pleased that he can tie together today's themes and point the way forward for bringing together biblical scholarship and dogmatic mm. theology. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for this opportunity. I see I roll here really. I have half an hour rather than the uh, hour because my role is to challenge, I think, and provoke so that the discussion uh, can be <coughs> enriched. Uh, and also, I think, because I'm not a Thomist, then it's, and I, in a way, I'm not really even a theologian. Um, and so... The question arising is, well, what does I do have any relevance to what theologians do? And I, that is what I want to show, and more than even just relevance, but actual, um, it should be a source, as we understand it. So, on your handouts are the texts that I will, will show, so I'm not going to read, mo- read them out, um, unless there's a, there's a point, really, that I want to make. So, um, refer also, if you want to get the full sense of what I'm going to talk about, um, from your handout. So, Robert Barron's, from Robert Barron's article, um, Biblical Interpretation and, and Theology, he joins a lot of theologians, and we've already heard mention of um, Joseph Ratzinger, on uh, calling for, um, in the light of what they might saw a hard cr- a historical critical approach to the Bible, um, for a, a return to the Bible as revelation. Um, and we've already heard of these three ways, then the third way is the integration of them. Um, that's all very well, that's fine, but in my view, these, uh, uh, this call has been heeded. Um, we have many people doing theological interpretation of the Bible now in academia. Um, one great proponent in this country is Walter Mobley um, in Durham University. Um, and so it's certainly something that isn't, isn't left out. But it seems to me what hasn't been uh, seen is the lack of turning to the Bible by theologians. Uh, and so what I'm speaking about today is not about theological interpretation of the Bible, per se, but about biblical scholarship as such, and theology as such, and how these need to come together, at least be aware of each other. So my question really is, has a similar plea for theology as such to integrate exegesis into its work, and not just its own exegesis of texts, but the work that is done by Biblists. So, we have here um, an example of the beginning of a theological introduction to the Pentateuch, um, and it's again speaking of the idea of how do you approach the Bible theologically. So this methodological discussion seems to centre only on increased theological interpretation of the Bible. Um, So the wider scope of dogmatic theology's engagement with exegesis, theological or otherwise, seems under-addressed. So here we have speaking, but this is still within the interpretation of the Bible, the different approaches, historical, critical, theological, and the call for integration. That's great. But so... Turning to Aquinas, it's fitting, really. Um, we've already heard about how Sacra Doctrina and Sacra Scriptura are used interchangeably by Aquinas. And yet Sacra Doctrina 
as T Thomas teaches, is enriched and clarified by appeal to the full range of human knowledge. So not just uh, sciences uh, uh, or theology and revelation, but a full range of human knowledge is clarified and enriched. So all the more, then, when God's revelation is the source and subject of this holy teaching, should theologians have an interest in the work of exegetes who use the human sciences, who use uh, textual criticism, um, archaeology, uh, and ancient history, and comparative uh, work. So a complaint can equally be made that there is a lack of exegetical engagement in dogmatic theology, despite the fact that it is exactly at this wider level of discourse that the church envisages the theological project to be engaged. Here is the text on sacred scripture from Vatican II, and this is the, this is the key. The study of the sacred page is, as it were, the soul of sacred theology. So if scripture is the soul of theology, theology as such needs at least awareness of the exegetical conversations. As I say, whether that exegesis is theological or otherwise. So here's something from what I've written from a um, book which is about um, the integration of different approaches to the biblical text. So I'm going to use this as an analogy for the wider question. So it can be drawn from integrated biblical study. So what people often speak of a synchronic approach to the Bible, which is taking a text as a whole and asking literary questions, looking at the story, looking at the narrative, looking at the theology. Uh, um, or diachronic. How did their sources come together? Um, is, are we speaking of an earlier edition that's been changed in, in accordance with some theology? As I say... Questions of a literary and theological nature are informed by diachronic issues. For example, the choice to present source material in a particular way. It's not just, it sh we shouldn't just end with saying, oh, here's four sources in this piece of the, uh, of the Bible. Why did somebody choose to present these sources in a particular way, and particularly with Judges, that book I worked on where this comes out? But my point is, it is a matter of data. And data drawn from all manner of approaches should be considered. And that is what I want to expand out to, to theology. Um, dogmatic theology, all data um, dra drawn from all manner of approaches in all fields and all types of biblical scholarship. But the foundation of sacred scripture is for a theology should be considered. So in the same way that both diachronic and synchronic approaches to the biblical text are relevant for rich understandings, so such rounded exegetical information is relevant in turn for theological issues in the wider sense. So these are the remarks. This is what I think uh, we ought to turn to and, and my, I suppose, appeal today. How can we undertake this? What, how, how does this look more specifically? Well, the literal sense, then. As this is a conference devoted to studying scripture with Aquinas, it is convenient to employ some of St. Thomas's concepts to illustrate the necessity of interaction between theological and biblical discussions. The mechanism for this integration I will describe with reference to what Thomas sees as foundational to understanding scripture, and hence sacra doctrina as a whole, namely scripture's literal sense. And so this is, is to what I said, so just some, uh, so, uh, the end of the first question, this is interesting, so right at the beginning of the summer, beginning this uh, understand, unfolding of what the Sacra Doctrina is, Thomas turns to these questions. So for Aquinas, the literal, literal sense is that which the author intends, and it informs all interpretations, and, and in this he's, un, um, he, he's unusual. All meanings are based on one, namely the literal sense. So it's not a case of spiritual senses, the other senses being something that appeals to us simply. If it's divorced from the literal sense, if it has no basis in the literal sense, then it's not legitimate. Now, prioritising the literal sense is not a step towards fundamentalism. And so Brian Davies has written about this sacred doctrine of theology. Uh, it would be wrong to take this meaning as Aquinas was a biblical fundamentalist, um, and he sees that from his own practice of commenting on scripture. And in uh, a very good document from more recently than Dave Urban on the interpretation of the Bible in the church, 
We, um, I, this is clarified by the church itself. The literal sense is not to be confused with the literalist sense to which fundamentalists are attached. So we can go back to Aquinas himself. The parabolical sense, sensus parabolicus, is contained in the literal sense. And so he speaks of this excellent example. We're all happy that the arm of God isn't talking about God having an arm. It's talking about his power. But that's the literal sense still. So this is the understanding. The literal sense is not literally. So it can have many genres. And this is, again, <coughs> Divino Aflanti, Spiritu, um, Pius XII then, uh, reiterates this idea that you actually have to go back and see the different modes of expression and deepen this. Thomas Aquinas's example, I'll give another example, is quite obvious. We want to be talking about the parable, we want to be talking about the figurative, but the, and the figurative being the literal sense. But my point is that this is not always obvious, and this is the work of uh, biblic- biblists, or the work of, let's better say, the work of biblists contribute to discerning the literal sense. So, human language is used to express it. So, to go back to the um, um, thought of those of the ancient peoples. So, this way, at the beginning of the summer, Thomas sets out the task for those wishing to engage in sacra doctrina, to discern the literal sense of scripture as the basis for theological work. But as I have said, and Thomas says as well, it's not straightforward, or not always straightforward. The truth of faith is in sacred scripture, but diffusely in diverse ways. So to draw out the truth of faith from scripture requires somebody who's very clever, requires a prolonged study and a practice not within the capacities of all. No. And Pius XII also says this. It's not always as obvious in the speechings of the writers of the ancient authors of the East as it is in the works of our own time. So... The call of the church, as well as in, in Thomas's work as well, is to look, go back to the things that what one might call hard biblical work does, that doesn't seem to have a theological uh, bent or a goal. Um, the text criticism, what, does, what do the other peoples of the ancient Near East do? The history behind the text, um, the history um, apart from the text, and the archaeology and all that. Pius XII, 1943, this was, lists history, archaeology, ethnology, and other other sciences accurately determine what modes of writing, what is the literal sense. So this is the project that is given to us. And finally, Thomas Gilby, um, who um, a lot of, where I see uh, um, in the appendix to the first um, volume of the Gilby Summer, uh, appendix 12, this is, uh, the senses of scripture, um, how in, this was 1960, how even then, compared with what Thomas had access to, we already spoke about he didn't know Greek very well, if at all, um, but there were many other things he did not have access to. And so while we take from Thomas the approach and, and, and heed his call to do the discerning of the literal sense, we also have many more um, Findings, many more discoveries, many more um, advances in the field to draw. So, what is envisaged uh, by Thomas, Thomas's imagination, um, I'm sure, would have been enhanced by what we're doing. So, it's not that we're going to just end up agreeing with Thomas in that way. We may actually need to disagree with him or go further than him, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind about that. So, just going to give two examples of discerning the literal sense uh, from work that is um, biblical scholarship that's nothing, you might think, nothing to do with theology. So the first is, is bringing to bear topography, um, a simple, very simple example that would be, and the second, a very more complex example, but great fun, um, text criticism from the uh, wonderful book of Syrac. So... Um, so these are two examples where discerning the literal sense is not straightforward given the range of data available from what Thomas Gilby in Appendix 6, Theology as Science, calls the entrance of God's revelation into our reasoning processes. So here we are, the two sciences referring to them, topography and textual criticism. So my example comes Judges. I know Judges the best of any book. Um, of the Bible. So 
Judges 9, 8 to 15, you may remember it's one of the very few passages from Judges that's read in the Mass, in the, in the, in the liturgy, uh, as, as a reading. This is the parable of Yotham, um, after he has escaped his brother's killing of all of his rest of his brothers. The trees went out to anoint for themselves a king. I think it's on your handout. Just as with Thomas is the arm of God, we're all very happy that their trees don't talk and that trees don't come to each other and say, we'd like a king and we'd like to be uh, anointed. So we're very happy that the literal sense of this is figurative. The literal sense of Judges 9, 8 to 15 is um, a figure, is a parable. One could go on, um, the object that is signified by the metaphor, again, this is Aquinas' language, and thus the content of the literal sense, we can still have uh, discussions about and, and, and bring forward. I have an idea about that. I have to read that in my book. Um, but, um, but nevertheless, what we're focusing on, what is the literal sense? The literal sense falls into what Thomas says, the parabolical, the uh, figurative. Fine. Let's just go one um, verse back. But first, this is the opening. Why are we looking at this? Okay. Um, the beginning of Judges 9, um, which I think is a self-contained account of Abimelech and his rise and fall. Abimelech, son of Yerubel, went to Shechem to his mother's brothers. So I just located um, for you on this map, here's the map of Israel. So you see Shechem in the n north sort of middle. Uh, that's where we're talking about. I'm sure Thomas Aquinas never went to Shechem, um, but you can. And so um, um, and that is a great thing to, to enhance our knowledge of the sort of things that the people writing Judges 9 knew that the people to whom they offered would have an idea about. So, here's the topography of Shechem, you see. So, Shechem um, falls in between two hills, really, although they're called mounts, mountains in Scripture. Significant mountains, Mount Gerizim in the south uh, west, Mount Ebal in the northeast. Uh, and as you can see, so there's a big plain in front of it. And that's the topography of Shechem. So, so why is this relevant? As I say, um, Abimelech goes to Shechem. So Shechem's the scene of the um, parable of the what we've just seen, that 8 to 15, lit uh, the figurative um, parable, which is the literal sense of those verses. So, this is a Mount Gerizim and Shechem today, viewed from Mount Ebal. So, uh, Mount Ebal's in the front, and Shech uh, Mount Gerizim is behind. The verse before, those verses about um, the parable, that the trees went out to find themselves a king, we are told, in the narrative sense, they told Yotham. What they told him was that um, all of his brothers had been killed by Abimelech. And he went and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim, and he lifted up his voice and he called and he said to them. And then he tells his parable. How is anyone hearing him from the top of um, Mount Gerizim? If that is um, where he's gone to speak. And of course this is modern and so I would have thought that all the settlement would be even smaller. And why does he go up to the top? It's so that no one can catch him. And so he's escaped from them. So my question, and this is a rather trivial thing, but my question is, what's the literal sense of this verse? It's told in a very straightforward, historiographical, narrative way. Jotham went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim. And if we simply see what Aquinas says in, about the literal senses, he would talk about a historical narrative as being relating what happened. But we have to perhaps rethink or reformulate how that can be true. I think more... Um, oh, I'll just give you a view. This is a view of Shechem from Mount Gerizim. So this is where Yotham is supposed to have been when he's trying to tell this parable to all the people down in the valley. Um, so my point is rather a trivial point, but what is the literal sense of that verse? And I would suggest that it has much more to do with the significance of that he goes on to Mount Gerizim, which is a very significant mountain, uh, which only appears in um, four three other places where it all talks about Mount Gerizim and Ebal and it's about the entry of the tribes into the promised land. Uh, half will be on Mount Gerizim to pronounce blessing and half on Ebal to pronounce curse. 
So I would have thought that, that, that the literal sense of that, my suggestion of this verse, would be more to do with a um, relationship to the, that story rather than worrying about whether Jotham could be heard from the top of the um, uh, mountain. However, you know, as I say, it's not straightforward because it's related to us in a narrative way. So it may seem a peripheral point to raise, and it probably is in this case. But my point is that conversions of data, textual, narrative, topographical, asks what is the literal sense of this. And Judges 9-7, to like most of Judges, is related in, a, in this historiographical narrative genre. And so, as I say, we might gloss over here. It's not, a, it's not a foundational sort of moment in the biblical history. But it, it, the question will bite uh, in, in different places when we talk about the Exodus, maybe, when we talk about the crossing of the Red Sea, things like that. And so awareness of this, my suggestion to you, is that awareness of topography, of archaeology, of movement, is not irrelevant. And, on, and actually, we need to know it, because then otherwise we're going to be led astray. It's not irrelevant to the discernment of the literal sense. And therefore, it's not irrelevant to theology. And finally, on this sort of, this point, Pontifical Biblical Commission, again, interpretation of the Bible of the Church, suggests the literal sense, as I've said, you know, can be parabolical, can be figurative, um, doesn't necessarily believe that the facts recounted actually took place. That's fine. But are we happy that... We might be happy that imaginative fiction can be applied to the book of Ruth, Esther, Job, um, Jonah, for example... But are we happy with that being how we describe judges? So it's, we still need to think about, but I say it doesn't help by not knowing about these sorts of things. So again, the work, therefore the work of archaeologists, topographists, and people like that who do biblical science in that way um, is not irrelevant but very helpful. So the full range of biblical science, including but not limited to theological interpretation, is relevant for sacra doctrina. So, moving to the second example, we've already mentioned textual criticism and that, that sometimes Aquinas um, acknowledges that and looks at it. And So these are just some, um, again, Pius XII was very keen on textual criticism, so I've just included for you some references to this esteem in which, he's held, uh, when, in which he holds um, the work of textual criticism. And in another place in, in Divine Flente Spiritu, he also speaks about the... Uh, priority, really, of the original languages, as he said, and the authority of the texts. I expect behind it also acknowledging that what those are is also a question often that needs to be looked at by biblical scholars. So, why... Now we move on to... Uh, now, I knew this would happen, so I'm sorry. It'll be on your... Because I... Um, that's the problem. I transferred this to the mat from to Microsoft, and so all of the things have gone funny. The, the, the fonts that are not um, Roman have gone funny, but you have it on your um, handout, so that's good. So, why have I firstly chosen Syrac 322? It's the first piece of scripture to which Thomas Aquinas refers in the summer. And, in, and, and yet all he writes is Altiora Tene Quesaris. So, um, he follows this up by a response to the objection in verse 25. Um, so, what, he, what you have here is the Latin, then the Greek, apparently, and then the, the Hebrew. So, um, but as you can see, they're not the same. And also, when Thomas writes Altioratene Quesaris, in the Vulgate anyway, it's Altioratene Scrutaveris. So, this is the second one. It gets even more tricky in the second uh, quotation by uh, Aquinas because um, verse 25 is not in the Greek. So, um, he gets a bit... So, where does this come from, it is the question. As you can see, the Vulgate that he quotes, verse 25 in the Hebrew is not anywhere near the same. So, that alerts us to going to engage in this next um, project, this next task of biblical scholarship, textual criticism. Let's have a look at all of these texts. But, I mean, you've got it on your handout, thankfully, because now it'll come up and it'll all be um, messed up. So, 
But Cyrek is a tricky text um, with a complex textual history. So we've already heard of the Vulgate. But he follows his Vulgate, but the Vulgate, the Syrac of Vulgate, uh, the Deuterocanonicals Jerome didn't translate like he didn't translate in the New Testament any of the books that are not the Gospels, if that makes sense. So where they come from, the old Latin tradition, but the old Latin tradition is collective title for the large and very diverse collection of Latin biblical texts used by the communities from the second centuries. And they're very diverse because people weren't too worried about translating them exactly, or there wasn't an overriding body that said, this is the critical edition. So you have a Vetus Latina, though the old Latin is very, very varied. And so... That's the first thing. So we don't know where really the Latin comes from. Um, it's not a person in the, the, from which Thomas quotes. So you've got the, at least you've got, and you have this in uh, nicely uh, printed out, I hope, um, on your handout. So as you can see, what's happened really is their um, versification problem. Verse 22, which is what Thomas quotes, is double the size of um, in the uh, Greek, and that is because they seem to have put 21 and 22 together in uh, the Vulgate. There's no 25, but 24 seems to correspond to 26. I, the Greek 24 is the Vulgate 26, and verse 23 seems to be 25. So 24 seems to be a smoothing over an addition because they've kind of got a bit messed up in how they're versifying it. And so they recapitulate. You, uh, et in pluribus operibus eus non eris curiosus, which sounds suspiciously familiar from verse 22 of the Vulgate. So that is an explanation once you have these things together. But, of course, um, Syrac, the prologue to Syrac, is Jesus ben Syrac's grandson telling us all how he's translated it from his grandson, uh, grandfather's Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew of which wasn't really found until the end of the 19th century uh, BC, uh, AD. So we're going to compare that, although you only have a translation now. Uh, the Hebrew is on the back of this, if you're interested, but this is the translation. So, you see how um, similar it is, but it does have some differences. So, you have um, things too troublesome and things too strong. Sounds quite similar to the, the Vulgate, so they've got that done that well. But things too wonderful for you do not sing, that was, which is hidden from you do not search out. So, these are, and we have um, uh, this verse 25 appears, which seems to be verse 24. Um, the idea that... Going too far, trying to, trying to find out things which aren't for you, leads to evil. And if we remain here, rather than going back into the theological um, interpretation that Thomas, to which Thomas uses it, calls the uh, uh, text into use, what we have in Hebrew, in the context of this, the context of um, the teaching of uh, Ben Syrah is that it is the instruction to people of, of knowledge by a teacher, by himself, uh, among other people. So Ben Starr instructs his students to accept human limitation of knowledge, as well as his authority, Ben Syrah's authority, to determine the limits of their inquiry. About what is kept from you, do not be bitter. So the things greater than you have been shown. So... That's really where you end up with the Hebrew. In the, in the Greek, it's been more than the understanding of men has been shown to you. So it's saying, basically, by following teaching, by being sitting at my feet as a teacher, you're, you're understanding much more than anybody else. Um, uh, and, and it's in this one. So don't worry about things I'm not going to tell you or things that I say. You read this, but don't read, read that. In the Greek, you've got a, a, a sort of rowing back from that a bit. Um, and it's thought that's because, of, again, the context of the grandson is more that with the Greeks and the Hellenization of searching after knowledge, that we don't want to be too um, prescriptive about what it is that people know. What is commanded you, these things understand, for you have no need of hidden things. So, you know, but what is remarkable among your, among your works, do not be concerned. So there's an ownership of the mystery, one might say, in the, in 
the, the Greek that's been a movement from that point of view. So before we go on to Syriac, we can go back to the Vulgate. And the difference here is verse 22. Sorry, if you look, so if you look at verse 22 of, of the Greek, what is commanded you? It's passive. These things understand. And, and from our knowledge of the, the Hebrew situation, we have um, what, what the teacher tells you, what I'm going to instruct you. That's, what, that's who's commanding. These things understand. In the Vulgate, those things which God's com- God commands you forever understand. So, and because, and although verse 21 is from earlier in Syrac, so it doesn't belong with this sort of uh, thing in in the other texts, because great is the power of God alone, and he is honoured by the humble. So in the Latin um, translation, um, they've gone for identifying who is the source of the teaching. So rather than the passive, it's an active, and it's God who is the subject. So we enter in this development there of understanding of who is it that hides things and who is it reveals things. And once you have God in this position, um, what is higher is lifting itself up to God, of course. It's not just, well, what the teacher is um, in him, his own wisdom uh, restricting you, but it is God. So the um, understanding of um, what is being taught about this passage is being elaborated is being deepened through these different understandings through the, the ex- exemplified by these different translations so again sorry if it's on the back of your um, handout but this is should be the syriac which you have um pretty similar to the hebrew with um one very very interesting addition you have again the same idea that it, it, it uh, a semitic idea that it resides with the teacher Things too hard for you do not seek. So it's, you know, don't, don't worry about things you're not going to get. Too strong for you. And then what is author, again, the same idea, what is authorised for you? What, what the teacher is telling, setting before you, that's what you need to understand. Don't concern what is hidden, what is kept from you. Um, and then this interesting thing about what is, uh, but with the rest of his deeds, do not be vexed, because things greater than you have been shown to you. So things greater are shown, they're not hidden, but... The deeds, maybe it's the deeds of the, the teacher. Or we could still be in the back of our minds thinking that this is God, um, as the Vulgate makes explicit. But again, the idea, here we have in the Hebrew that's translated, because many are the machinations of the sons of Adam. Many are their human opinions. We've been talking about heresy and how Thomas is combating. It sounds very familiar. Because many are their human opinions and evil forms which lead astray. That's why you need to keep on the, what is told you by the teacher, sacra doctrina, holy teaching. But then if we, with the Vulgate we can bring God in, we can see where the source of all these things. So the distinction, sons of Adam, human opinions, already lends itself to an interpretation of that to be distinguished from the divine. Um, and this is the interesting thing that you have, just as a tag on the end of verse 25. With, in the Hebrew, without a pupil, light is lacking, and without knowledge, wisdom is lacking. So that is a comparison with, what, in fact, what Jesus says as well, that the eye is the gateway to the soul and the, if it, the light and everything. It's, exactly, it's the same image. Without a pupil, an eye pupil you can't see, light is lacking. So without knowledge, wisdom is lacking. It's an exhortation to know the knowledge, the holy teaching, the sacra doctrina. But in the Syriac, it goes further, because who is being taught, it seems, people who are going to be teachers themselves. He who does not have the eyes pupil, it's specified in the Syriac, lacks light. In what you are devoid of knowledge, you should not be promising instruction. So, at the end of that, it's do not go down the human opinion, do not deviate, do not seek after hidden things, things that are hidden from you by your teacher because then you will not be a good teacher because you will end up being led astray by evil forms and so this final example the textual history then of Ben Sire enriches the point when we get back to it that Aquinas makes about sacra doctrina and its basis in revelation so humility is necessary in verse 21 in all the version of this in the face of remarkable and hidden things, and docility is necessary. Do what is authorised, what is um, uh, commanded you, and in the Vulgate, what God commands you. Be docile. And then, things which are greater than human understanding can be apprehended. Um, That's verse 23. 
But only what is chosen to be revealed. And again, that's what Thomas is talking about as well. You know, there are obviously infinite things in God. And God has chosen his revelation, and that is what we need to study. So although we can things greater than, um, the, than uh, human understanding has been shown to us, about what is kept for you, do not be bitter. Don't try and um, uh, go beyond revelation, I think one could say. So purely human speculation after hidden things can lead to evil. And so we might say, in other words, ignore God's revelation. Ignore scripture at your peril, particularly if you're trying to do things about God. So, in summary, finally, sacra doctrina, holy teaching, dogmatic theology, must find its basis in God's revelation, sacra scriptura, and its literal sense. And to discern the literal sense, we need the work of biblical scholarship. Otherwise, to pick up the cryptic comment found only in the Syriac of Ben Syra, in what you are devoid of knowledge, you should not be promising instruction. Thank you very much.